Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed the um, video by James Rolfe at Cinemassacre, the tour of the actual location of Sleepy Hollow. Um, Sleepy Hollow as a story is fascinating for a number of reasons. It gets us into real, actual literature. For the most part, what we've been experiencing has been philosophical writing and religious writing and political writing. Um, there's been very little in the way of literature because most of what was uh, being consumed at this point was theological and political. Um, Irving comes along, and Irving is part really of the early romantics. Um, this, he paves the way for Hawthorne to come later, and we'll really, really pick apart Hawthorne next week while I'm grading the papers. Um, also, let me go ahead and uh, say what it is I'm going to do for grading the papers. I'm going to have to take my camera here. Um, my office hours are from 10 to 12 every day. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm, um, I'm going to grade the papers, and I'm going to put the grade in the grade book where you can see them. But every day from 10 to 12, I will be in this room, and I will be bored because I'll be waiting for you to call me so that I can tell you why you got the grade that you got and give you advice on how to improve it. If the 10 to 12 office hours is not going to work for you, contact me and let me know and I will set up an appointment with you. Otherwise, just call me during those hours and we'll talk and we'll touch base. Um, this is the due date for the first paper. Um, the paper was, how has the literary world changed since the first pieces that we've read? Uh, so if you're behind on that, contact me, we'll catch you up. Back to Irving. Irving is our first example of a real story. And I absolutely love the way James Rolfe describes this. Uh, the way that he... Sleepy Hollow really is like something you would hear at a bar. Or in a like you know in an inn somewhere. It's uh, I like to think of it like it's snowing outside. You're you're warm, and there's some old guy somewhere telling you a story. That is very much Irving. Um, and the funny thing is, is like from a literary standpoint, it's hard to interact with Sleepy Hollow and get really big insights from it because it is very much just one of those fun stories. It's not trying to be heavy-handed. It's, it's trying to be whimsical, and it's trying to scare you a little bit at the end. Um, now, this is, I actually kind of like to point this out to people here at the very beginning, because from here, when we go into Hawthorne, it's going to get serious. It's going to get really dark really fast. You thought Day of Doom was bad? Wait till you read The Minister's Black Veil, and that'll have your head spinning. But we do get to kind of play around with horror for a little while, and I like doing that going into October and Halloween, but... You know, we still have some time, but Sleepy Hollow is lighthearted, and it removes the supernatural element a bit. If you read the entire thing, it becomes pretty clear, at least to me, that Crane was punked or pranked by Brom Bones. He, and, I mean, it, it seems pretty heavy-handed to me. Now, in modern iterations of the Sleepy Hollow story, uh, people want to make the Headless Horseman like a real thing, right? They want to make him like some type of real ghost that's really chasing a Kabod Crane. That's not what happens in the story, at least from my standpoint. Now, you can get all heavy-handed and try to um, really read into it and try to stretch to make yourself think that the, the Headless Horseman described in the story is real, but I just don't think the textual... I don't think the text supports that. Now... I do want to make a little bit of a comment about one thing that we can kind of look into the America, the small town America mindset here that Irving gives us a glance into. America was a place that was birthing a lot of history. There was a lot of stuff going on in the colonial era. There was a lot of heroism. I would argue, I can get in a lot of trouble for this, I would argue that we created a bit of a cult around our founding fathers and around the revolutionaries. There was a lot of really weird folklore stories that circulated about how awesome they were and how godlike they were in so many different respects. But America was hungry to make a culture, to make a kind of history and a, and a weird sort of spiritualism for itself. And in the years following the colonial era and the revolution, 
that surfaces quite a bit. And one of the things that you'll notice when we get into Minister's Black Veil is that the preacher, I mean, oh, excuse me, Hawthorne is constantly wrestling with the Puritans. Almost all of his writing references the Puritans in some way. So from this point, American literature becomes very self-referential. We're looking back on the things that we've wrestled with, and it takes us a little while to basically come into the present and start treating America as something that is in the here and now. We become obsessed with the past. Now, with Irving, this small little town, Sleepy Hollow, is haunted by the images of the revolution, literally. This was a war that was fought in these people's backyards. And there was a lot of horrible stuff that happened. And it was a, it was a time of great stress and a time of great trauma. And, you know, in a, lot of, in a lot of ways, these little small towns, they had created their own mythologies in a lot of ways, referencing back to these great heroes of old that stood up against the British, the British Empire and won. And for, for Sleepy Hollow in this instance, the Headless Horseman was the specter of foreign power. I'm really stretching here. I'm really theorizing here. But the, the, the mercenary was a Hessian mercenary. He was German right? Or, or rather, you know, in that area. It's important to understand that this German mercenary, this Hessian, imagine, these, pe these were people who identified as British for a long time. They came over here and they began building an American identity. Britain, in their war with the revolutionaries, hired mercenaries, people who were battle-hardened and bloodthirsty, to come over here and fight their war for them. That would cause a great deal of negative emotion and trauma. And so you, this figure of this headless horseman, this person who lost his head in a, in, 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 I think it was supposed to be a cannon that hit him, it's, it's like we hold on to these stories to have some type of connection to the past. Now, what's interesting, and I'm not going to go crazy with this, but we still have really weird local stories like this to this day that kind of spread around like kind of like a disease. Uh, from where I lived in Statesboro, and there's like a whole bunch of cities in America that have this exact same freaking story. There was a place out in the woods that used to be a railroad bed, and it's a long dirt road. Now, a whole bunch of locals will tell you that if you go out to that dirt road in the middle of the night, you will see a man with a lantern. Or you'll see train lights coming down the road like they're heading right at you. And supposedly, you can see the person holding the lantern has lost his head. This comes from a very odd folk story of a person working on the train lines, and he fell, and the train ran over him, and he cut off his head. You can, all, you can also track this to, trace this to a really weird folk story, um, I mean, a folk song covered by Lead Belly, and eventually Nirvana in uh, Unplugged in New York, called um, Where Did You Sleep Last Night? It's the exact same story about a man who, in this case, was murdered uh, seemingly, because the, the song is purposely vague, seemingly murdered by his girlfriend, and was pushed on the lines, and the train cut his head off. So, like, this, the Headless Horseman seems to be participating in a very, very thick and um, time-honored tradition of like that local folk story that, for whatever reason, usually involves someone being decapitated. Isn't that weird? We still have this to this day. Me and a bunch of friends of mine used to ride out into those woods in a car looking for the ghost. I want to say I'm embarrassed, but I'm not, because those were some of the funnest nights of my entire life. And again, this is literature. In literature, we have a tendency to sit back and philosophize, like, my literature reveals something deep about the human mind and the human condition, and you can only access it with deep study and reflection. But at the end of the day, our literature did come not necessarily from a high-minded, snotty, you know, stuck-up, mm, Milford, can you get me some more of that cheese? Instead, 
This was something that people did to entertain themselves. They read these books because there was nothing else really for them to do but read books. They wrote because they enjoyed writing it. The literature of yesteryear was the box office of today. When I asked you to write about the current state of American literature, I made it very clear that you can talk about movies. You can talk about albums and songs and TV shows because that's what this was for these people. So at the end of the day, try to read Sleepy Hollow. Try to enjoy it. Try to imagine yourself in a nice warm cabin somewhere up north and it's cold and you're drinking the most delicious cup of hot chocolate you can imagine. And there's this old guy and he's telling you a story and you're really into it. And that's, that is one of the best ways to read this, is to actually just try to enjoy it. Rather than do this historical analysis that I always employ. Thank you very much. Enjoy your weekend. If you're still working on those papers, I'll give you a few more days. But get it in. Thank you. Next week, Minister's Black Veil. I'll, uh, hmm. Do I want to go ahead and give you a discussion question? Sure, I will. I like doing this in the videos to make sure you people are watching my videos. Why did the minister wear the veil? What's up with that? Let me know.